Ayubhavan. On behalf of Vishwaniketan International Peace Center, I would like to welcome our distinguished speaker, Dr. Sunita Krishnan, to the sixth episode of A String of Pearls, a series of intergenerational dialogues. Dr. Sunita has been a great friend of Sarvodaya and Vishwaniketan for a long time. We have vivid memories of your visit to Sri Lanka in 2011 to deliver the 20th Kanchana Abhayapala Human Rights Memorial Oration on the theme, open quote, proactive transformation, safeguarding the rights of women and children in a developing economy, close quote, organized by Sarvodaya Legal Services Movement. I would like to share some precious moments of your last visit to Sri Lanka in 2014 for the Metta International Convention on Healing of Hearts organized by Vishwaniketan. Namaskar. My work with the most excluded, most marginalized, most ostracized, most stigmatized group of women and children, those who, whom, who are subjected to sexual slavery and sexual violence, children as young as four and five years old, whose bodies are sold so that the libido of some man somewhere is satisfied. My work with them has shown me it is not what they can do to the world. It is what we can do for them. Metta to me personifies the beginning, the journey and the end to open our own hearts, our own hearts with compassion, our own hearts with empathy to bring in the most excluded of these women and children back to our hearts, to include them as one among us. Thank you. It is nothing but synchronicity that one of the children who ushered you to the stage in 2014 happens to be one of the moderators of today's dialogue. I would like to recall that this series is organized uh, to felicitate Dr. Eti Ari Ratna, the founder of Sarvodhi Movement and Vishwaniketan, as he steps into the ninth decade of his life on 5th November, 2021. Through this series, Vishwaniketan intends to inspire young generations uh, to be conscious of their responsibility to care for the well-being of humans, animals, and the plant world. We are holding this dialogue on the theme despair and hope on a day that has a great historical significance the International Day for the Remembrance of the Slave Trade and its Abolition. It was on 23rd August 1791, the world saw the beginning of the uprising that paved the way in the abolition of slave trade. We cannot think of a more suitable speaker to discuss the subject of modern day slavery than Dr. Sunita Krishnan, the founder of Prajbala, the largest institution in Asia combating commercial sexual exploitation. Since its inception in 1996, Dr. Sunita has assisted in the rescue of more than 24,500 young girls and women across 12 countries, recipient of the fourth highest Indian civilian honor, Padma Shri, and recognized as 150 fearless women in the world by Newsweek, Sunita envisions a world free of sex trafficking and sex crime and has galvanized her vision by confronting traffickers, supporting survivors and developing innovative models of prevention to disrupt the cycle of intergenerational exploitation. For her Herculean contribution to combating trafficking, Dr. Sudita has received many local and international awards. To name a few, 
Sri Shakti Award, Tolberg Global Leadership Prize, Franco-German Prize for Human Rights, Vital Voices Leadership Prize, Living Legends Award, John J. International Award, DVF Award, Aurora Peace Prize, and CNN IBN uh, Real uh, Hero Award, among several others. This intergenerational dialogue series is being moderated by two child moderators, Tiara and Sanara, who have been active participants of Vishwaniketan spiritual retreats from an early age. Also, Tiara and Sanara have already played an active role in addressing social causes that are passionate uh, that they are passionate about. With this introduction, I would like to invite Tiara and Sanara to commence this sixth episode with Dr. Sunita Krishnan. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Charika. Now, before we commence our dialogue, I would like to invite Dr. Ari to share a few words with us on the topic, despair and hope. Now I am uh, what shall I say? Now I am in my 90s now. So when I look back from my 13th or 14th year up to today, I have faced many challenges. Challenges, some of them, two or three of them, would have cost my life, but I never despaired. Neither I hoped, neither despair or hope is going to help you. But if you live at this moment and face the problem straight away, you will definitely find a good solution so that you don't have to wait hoping, neither you have to despair. So best thing is equanimity, where you accept good and bad, whatever good things that happen to you, whatever bad things that happen to you, take all of them with equanimity. That is the advice I give you, I can give you, but uh, of course, Never despair. Always keep hope. If possible, you at this moment and develop equanimity. Upekha. Go ahead with your conversation because I don't want to disturb you. Thank you, Dr. Ari. Now I would like to invite Sanara to commence the dialogue. Good evening, Doctor. It truly is an honor to have you here with us today. I hope you are doing well. I am good. Thank you. That's great to hear, Doctor. So let's dive right into the first question. The work you've done over the years to put an end to human trafficking is truly inspiring. Reflecting on your journey of healing the, uh, the suffering of women and children, how would you describe your experiences along the way? Uh, Sinara, thank you so much. Um, first of all, my humble pranams to Sri Ari Ratne. Uh, 90 years, um, nine decades of transformational leadership uh, is, is a huge legacy he leaves us. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, and it's an intergenerational dialogue uh, it, with that kind of a legacy that, that Appa, uh, Sri Ari Ratne, um, has uh, with us at this moment is uh, is is a beautiful transformational, and I think one of the biggest living changes that we see. And so, extremely honored that I'm part of a series uh, that honors this legacy. Uh, coming to your your question about what has been my journey about, uh, I've been. Uh, fighting against a modern day form of slavery. Uh, while slavery was, uh, slave trade was abolished in 1791, uh, modern day slavery exists today in the form of human trafficking. 
hundreds and uh, thousands and millions of uh, human beings, uh, mostly women and children, are sold for various purposes of exploitation. Um, uh, of course, women and children being more vulnerable than men. Uh, so when I, I uh, decided or chose uh, to embark on this journey, uh, three things were very clear to me. I'm fighting um, one of the largest organized crime. Uh, I'm also fighting a criminal enterprise, uh, which is one of the fastest growing criminal enterprise in the world. Um, as per the UN estimates, human trafficking is uh, 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 the third largest organized crime in the world. And it is the fastest growing criminal enterprise, a billion dollar industry. And in uh, uh, a third reality that uh, the entire world of this modern day slavery is, is founded on the vulnerabilities of human beings. So this is, uh, this is where I began my journey. Uh, and, and therefore, it, it, it is not just a, um, you know, a social dogma or a moral dogma that one is fighting about. One is fighting a huge business interest. One is fighting a huge criminal syndicate. So what, what defines my journey? Uh, I think it is conviction. It is deep-rooted persistence and perseverances because uh, this journey to, to end a modern day form of slavery is one step forward and hundred steps backward. Because at every, every point you are hit, at every point you are challenged, you are confronted, you are attacked, you are assaulted. Um, for those in slavery, like, like in, in early 1700s, the slaves could not recognize that they were um, they were slaves and they had kind of normalized the experience of being in slavery. Similarly, in this modern day form of slavery too, uh, you know, you, you see a world of human beings who, who are stuck and trapped in this, uh, in, in, in the situation of servitude and yet are unable to, you know, emotionally or morally uh, or physically uh, create a platform for themselves to come out of it. So you're dealing with external forces, um, you know, who do not want you to be here, but you're also dealing with internal forces of the person whom you are serving, uh, who, who believes that, you know, I, I am, I am okay. I don't want to be out. So it's kind of a dual battle. So this journey is about perseverance. And uh, this journey is also about, um, Believing in your inner conviction and holding on to it no matter what. Thank you, Doctor. I think that is truly inspiring. Something we all could learn to identify the causes that we resonate with and to persevere no matter what. It's something I think the younger generation could definitely take home through your experience as well. The second question I have today is that sexual exploitation of women and young girls like us is a prevalent problem we face in a global scale, but also is largely present within the region we're from. Could you help us understand the root causes of this problem and what contributes to it within our societies? I think, Tiara, the, the root cause, our universal root cause, uh, which I would attribute, which was, which is kind of cutting across boundaries, borders across the world, from the first world to the third world, is the silence around it. Uh, I, I, I contribute that as the root cause. Well, each of our countries have our own, um, you know, uh, our, our own construct of the gender stereotypes that we have. Each of our countries have our own set of. Uh, um, uh, gender discrimination, gender divide, and gender biases, uh, uh, which is coupled with uh, the culture of that country, the culture of that region, which makes it either worse or more. Uh, countries like India, for example, um, traditionally find you know the birth of a girl child as a burden, and 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 as something that is you know as a liability. 
and 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 that is where you you start thinking of a human being as as a liability and burden and something that can be easily disposed of simultaneously you also create another construct that this burden can be used and misused and and it is it is her responsibility to be misused and used. so so whole patriarchal you know norms uh, that come in and uh, you know while every country has its own uh, face of it uh, united states of america has one face of patriarchy india has another sri lanka has another so you know globally and universally the uh, the, the levels of uh, perforation of uh, patriarchy is different in different cases but what is universally common for all of us is the silence around it and for me that is the root cause of this problem because what silence per per perpetuates is a enabling environment for the perpetrators to do these crimes and get away with it all of us in many ways are collectively responsible for committing this crime uh, uh, across the border the, the, the universe is actually uh, responsible in many ways and universe means each one of us sitting here listening to this conversation too where in the name of honor in the name of prestige in the name of you know uh, i don't know what all in different different cultures it would be different different ways you want to hide this under the carpet you want to behave as if this does not happen in the end what are you doing you're just creating an enabling environment for exploitation to continue and the exploited exploiters to feel more and more confident more and more strong so if many many years back it was 10 year olds and 15 year olds now it is even six month babies so somewhere we have collectively failed in challenging ourselves our silence around this that to me is the root cause of this problem thank you doctor your words were truly inspiring and i too believe that all these problems that prevail in society are ignored and just hidden so people are unaware of what's happening and they don't know that cases like this rape of even children as young as six months it happens but they're ignorant to it because it's you know, it's just disregarded and no one really speaks up for that and i Sanara, think Sanara, i would like to beg to differ from you i don't think anybody is ignorant about it it's just kind of selective selective seeing what you want to see it just doesn't make you comfortable to see these things so you selectively keep it out it's not that you're ignorant today with social media with technology with television with everything around us nobody can claim to be ignorant it is just you know a selective choice we are making that we want to you know ignore this problem we want to be silent on this problem we want to actually look away from this problem it is not that people don't know about this it's just that they don't think it can happen to them and they don't think they, sh they should get involved in these things. So I think it more than ignorance, it is the selective silence around it. Sorry, Sinara, sorry. Please That's continue. very true, Doctor, what you said. Uh, let's dive into our third question. During the past 12 months, it has been reported that over 243 million girls and women between the ages of 15 and 49 around the world have been subjected to sexual and physical abuse by an intimate partner. Due to the COVID-19 lockdowns, there has also been a rapid increase in the cases of domestic violence and cyber crimes as well. In your eyes, how have the dynamics of these issues changed along with the pandemic? I think the pandemic has changed the world, I don't know for better or for worse. But uh, uh, what I see from the lens that I am in, and each one of us have, one of us have our own uh, different lenses of viewing this pandemic, the huge, huge economic devastation that followed the pandemic, the lockdowns, the entire mobility restriction. And due to the economic devastation that happened, 
the kind of uh, you know newer vulnerable communities i think you already had the poor the disadvantaged the marginalized who are vulnerable now thanks to this pandemic you also have a huge and new generation of vulnerable communities who have become so desperate desperate to survive desperate to just exist you know and uh, it, it is in this context that the most vulnerable among them children have taken the disproportionate burden of the consequences of this uh, of this pandemic in india if you see uh, labor exploitation of children ch children in labor trafficking has increased hundredfold uh, children in in brothels have increased hundredfold uh, you have a whole world of you know uh, liability disposing mechanism campaign kind of things going on where hundreds and millions of girls are getting married off quickly child marriages have increased hundredfold but worst and worst is this virtual medium that we are talking to each other today which has been able to connect us from here hyderabad to uh, you sitting there in sri lanka has also become the reason for the exploitations of million of millions of children online sexual exploitation of children has increased 500 fold during this pandemic and I, I feel very, very disturbed and very upset to share with you that our country, the country that I come from, India, uh, was, um, you know, as per the NICMEC, NICMEC is a national agency for uh, missing and exploited children in the United States, and they keep a tab on online child sexual exploitation uh, across the world. And uh, one of the uh, findings of NICMEC is India is the highest content generator of online child sexual abuse of material, which essentially means that millions of children are getting sexually exploited virtually. The online penetration, schools closing down, online classes, adults unable to guide children on safety on using these technology because we past 50 are still te technologically challenged sanara you and tyra come to an age who are you are far ahead of us in terms of technology whereas you know my eight-year-old nephew tells me how to use the mobile properly he tells me about how to use the signal which is an app i understand or the telegram i don't know about it so uh, we are living in a in a huge generational crisis where the the, the adult generation is unable to guide the younger ones because they are technologically challenged. They really don't know what, how to do it. And, and therefore, there's this toy that the child has got and this whole world of predators who are on this platform uh, who are now spotting these very children and spotting those vulnerable those emotionally vulnerable children and uh, sexually exploiting them. I, I was, uh, you know, uh, panning the uh, ch child sexually abuser material across across the country. Uh, and uh, one of the things that really shook me was that practically maybe 90% of the children did not even know that they were being abused and the video was being recorded. And therefore, uh, you know, uh, you know these these cases would not even be reported so while the crime has been committed the crime has been circulated disseminated on whatsapp on uh, visual media on all kinds of websites on the dark web on the surface web everywhere but the person who's you know who's who's being victimized does not even know what's happening around her or him and that is a world of uh, you know uh, uh you know, what do you say uh, a pandemic of you know uh exploitation that i would say that is happening which is one of the biggest humanitarian disaster that all of us are now silently watching and i am afraid uh you know when all this explodes i really don't know what is the shape and face of the explosion that each one of us will We'll see, and 
it is in that context um, you know this kind of a series uh, these kind of pearls of knowledge with information uh, becomes very critical and very important because the world needs to know the disaster that we are heading to i agree with you doctor um similarly i i i think that people in most uh, vulner are most vulnerable to enter into exploitive industries and especially children are burdened uh, because of the low socio economic backgrounds they come from most often than not leaving parents helpless similar recent case uh, took place in sri lanka where a young girl was abused in her um, in her workplace and so cases like that are extremely saddening and i think this entire pandemic just worsens the situation here um and i personally take all sorts of precautions because doing everything online knowing it's not safe and secure is frightening as a as a young girl um being exposed to all these virtual platforms so i try to protect myself as much as i possibly can but i know there's so many more out there who get caught into the dangers of um these type of cyber exploitations so it's definitely something that must be spoken about more and like you said earlier a silence is the biggest barrier we have here so the more people vocalize and educate each other um the faster we are at solving the issue at hand moving on to the next question we have today is that what advice do you have for parents and caregivers of survivors to help rebuild their shattered lives and also to ensure that children are protected from all forms of violence and exploitation i think importantly is for the parents and caregivers to understand that it is not the child's fault what the child requires is your empathy your compassion your acceptance and most importantly uh, the support for the child to understand that that he or she has been victimized and uh, therefore to take all care not to victimize the child um in most cases of uh, child sexual exploitation the sec secondary victimization that the child goes through in the hands of uh, stakeholders Uh, including parents and caregivers is perhaps far more devastating than the abuse itself and therefore um my first my first uh you know uh advice to every parent is uh to to let to please understand your child has not made a mistake uh in somebody has uh committed a mistake on the child and it's not the child's fault the second thing that i would like to um you know uh, advise every parent and caregiver is that um, uh you know by hiding the issue by silencing the child and silencing yourself and not reporting reporting the crime is is the biggest crime that you can commit because when you hide these things under the carpet when you hide this under the under the garb of you know whatever fear or stigma that you fear uh, or the repercussions that you fear that can happen to you what you're doing is creating an enabling environment for the perpetrators to function with impunity so do not do not be part of a collective uh, conspiracy to build a world of impunity for perpetrators and exploiters to function and that is why it is so important very important that you report report this exploitation to whoever is the authority in your own country the third thing that i would like to advise justice justice is key to recovery if i am wronged and when all this i i do not get justice there is no closure in my life it is it's going to be one of my you know greatest greatest burden that i carry on my soul that for the crime committed on me i have not got justice and therefore to every parent and caregiver out there i i would strongly strongly um uh you know uh, appeal to you 
please, please uh, support your child's journey for justice, fighting it out, getting the kind of uh, justice delivery that the child requires is a big part of her or his recovery because that is when the final closure happens. But that is also a great, great contribution that you're making to the society because when there is justice delivery, then exploiters and perpetrators are punished for the crime that they have committed. And that is how deterrence comes. That is how fear comes to society. And you know, if I do this, this is the consequence I have to bear. And this is going to be a, a very costly thing for me. I do not, I should not be doing this. So even if somebody has an idea to, to exploit somebody else, they would think twice. And therefore, every action of yours has a great bearing, not only on your child, but also the world around you. So it is for us, for, for you and me, to create a safe world, not only for your children, but for all the children in the world. That's very true, Doctor. And I feel like in most cases, the perpetrator feeds on your silence. Your silence is basically like their nutrition. And people tend to keep whatever abuse and uh, from sexual or even physical abuse they've been through, they keep it silent because society tends to look down upon them. Uh, but then by doing that, they're also feeding to the, uh, you know, the power of the, the perpetrator or the person who is committing such crimes. And I really feel like the best we can do is create awareness and raise our voice on the current that actually. I'm moving on to the fifth question, the physical damage caused to the survivors of abuse and sexual assault may heal over time, but unfortunately, the damage caused to that emotional and mental well-being is truly heartbreaking. Not only do they have to live with the shadows of the, their past incidents, but they're often looked down upon in society. They are discriminated and disregarded. People seem to rub salt in their wounds much rather than help heal them. What is your message to these survivors and also members of society on how they can heal and help heal these wounds? Sanara, uh, my firm conviction is that we need, each one of us need to understand there's only one certifying authority uh, for your character and that is you yourself. Nobody, nobody in the world can certify your character other than you. You're, you're, you're the only soul authorized body who can certify your character. So I think each, each survivor needs to understand that. The moment you give the power of signing or the authori authorizing authority to the world outside, to the society outside, to, to the community outside, to certify your character, you are losing your power and somebody else is gaining the power to hurt you and to destroy you. So the first thing I would say is you have to look into your own eyes and say, you have not done a mistake. You don't need to hide your face. You don't need to shy away. You don't need to blur your images. You are beautiful. You have no done no harm. Harm has been done on you. And if you can see the beauty of your soul through your own eyes, you start respecting only yourself. And then validation of what the world says does not matter. World is a very, very, um, uh, very conniving and manipulative group of people because they look for signs from you uh, to see where, where is your weak point, where can they hurt you. And when you give those signs to them saying that, okay, uh, you know, whatever you think of me, that is what I think I am. Uh, that is when you're giving that power to hurt you to, in their hands. So ensure that you don't do it. And once you, you believe in yourself, have faith in yourself, and 
you become the sole authority for your character the sole authority for your uh, for i for your identity you will realize the world will try to attack you once attack you twice and then they see okay it is not really hurting the her it is she she's just moving around she's just doing what she wants to do they simply move out of the scene don't give power to any other human being other than your own self have the courage to see the power inside you in the layers and layers of pain that you have been subjected to is a huge volcano of power that you need to harness and bring out believe in that and believe that you are your maker and you are your destroyer by allowing others to affect you you become your own destroyer by allowing yourself to make you uh, build you create an identity of you you become the most powerful person in your own eyes and that is what is important so believe in yourself believe that nobody can hurt you other than you so don't allow allow anybody to hurt you because you can create a wall around you for your own safety thank you doctor i think those words are truly inspiring um for survivors and also for us trying to help uh victims of uh, abuse and violence to to understand that no matter what happens no matter how the external forces may affect you that you would never lose autonomy over your own body and you have the power to rebuild and dictate how your life is going to look like and one thing is similarly in vishwani ketan uh, dr charika has worked with a lot of uh, victims of sexual exploitation and all forms of violence and i've too helped her in certain projects and one little activity we normally do with these children is we provide them uh, this shattered clay pot and you know we give it to them and we ask them do you think that this pot uh, could be fixed back together to reach its normal shape and form and most often they're not they underestimate and they say they highly doubt it but we say you know what why don't you give it a try so little by little they take uh, glue and they 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 paste the shattered pieces of the pot together and in addition to that they make the pot beautiful they paint over it they add colorful sequins and we often go with the theme light shines light shines bright through broken places so the message that the children receive end of the day is that no matter how shattered you think you are there is always ability for you to glue back those pieces and shine bright again so before i move on to the next question i would like to share a small video clip of that activity
hope you enjoyed that video, Doctor. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Thank you. Moving on to our final question for today's dialogue. I've heard stories of girls overcoming some of the most adverse challenges. Despite going through tough times, I personally believe that there's always light at the end of the tunnel. What message could you share with the audience to help them overcome despair and instill hope through turbulent times? I think I will borrow words from what Appa said in the beginning of this dialogue. I think um, living for the moment uh, and, uh, and with equanimity uh, is perhaps maybe you know, most golden, uh, you know, advice that any human being can give and Appa has given that. But uh, having said that, I also would, uh, uh, would like to uh, add that uh, every adversity is an opportunity. It's also a choice that you make. Uh, these are adverse times. There are also very adverse times in our own lives. Uh, and we have a choice right in front of us, whether we get sucked up to that adversitation and crash and destroy ourselves, or like a phoenix, you know, rise and um, see the strength in yourself, the see the power that is there in your soul, and see the capacities and capabilities that you possess and come out of it. What I would, I would, uh, uh, you know, appeal to each one of you all out there is, uh, we have to make the choice to see light. Uh, it, is, it is so easy to see the darkness. But if we make a choice that we want to see the light, and every adversity becomes an opportunity. Every obstacle becomes the stepping stone for success. Every failure becomes the reason for a huge world of achievement which comes your way. So believe it, believe that life is possible, not only in your life, but in, in all the lives that surrounds you, and believe also that you could be that light. So uh, I think making the choice uh, yourself is the key part of it. And uh, again, I just repeat what I said earlier. You are the master of your destiny. Whether you make yourself or break yourself is in your hands. So please make a choice to make yourself and become the light for yourself and for the world around you. Thank you so much, Doctor. Your words were truly inspiring and we had such an engaging dialogue today. It was so inspirational to hear from different generations about their take on our topic today, despair and hope. And it definitely inspired the younger generation to take action and continue to fight stuff like exploitation and protect the world we're living in. So without further ado, I'm going to hand in back controls to Dr. Chaika to uh, gi give a few closing remarks. Thank you, uh, Tiara. Uh, thank you, Sanara. Uh, I'm speechless, uh, Dr. Sunita. Uh, in 2011, I discovered you uh, on the internet, on the cyberspace. And um, we were looking for a potential speaker for the Kanchanabe Pala Memorial Lecture, and I found you, and I saw you for the first time uh, only after you arrived in Sri Lanka. And from the moment I had the very first kind of contact with you, I sensed, you know, a very a fearless woman of our time. And we are truly, truly proud of you. You know, you are a role model for, the, for this generation. Uh, I think this intergenerational dialogue means so much 
you know, to us, especially when you see the different interpretations, different views expressed by, I, I think there are four generations in this dialogue. And I think each generation has a, 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 a role to play in, uh, in protecting women and children. And, uh, and you rightly said like a pandemic of exploitation, I think in amidst uh, a pandemic of uh, you know, COVID. So I think uh, we, we are all part of this whole, uh, the two uh, sides of the pandemic two different pandemics, but very much interdependent and interrelated. So I think you have given us again, you have re you reiterated uh, the, the importance of taking a sta stand, doing whatever you can. In, at Vishwaniketan, we tried our best to address these issues from a spiritual perspective. That is the reason why I think Dr. Ari said in the beginning, uh, he interpreted the, 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 two, the, 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 the two terms, despair and hope, and said that we have to cultivate equanimity. You have uh, you know, fought a long, long battle. I'm sure you have inspired many in India, across the world. I think today, through these intergenerational dialogues, you have uh, truly inspired these two young uh, girls and also hundreds and thousands of girls across Sri Lanka. I would like to express our gratitude to you on behalf of the Board of Trustees of the ATRI Ratna Charitable Trust for your you know, most valued presence in this dialogue. I know uh, when you say there's a pandemic of exploitation, you are as busy as uh, the Minister of Health in, in India, I, 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 I know. So I, I'm ever so grateful to you for finding this time and also uh, very best wishes, congratulations on the Silver Jubilee of Prajwala. And we hope that Prajwala could give the leadership not only in this region, but across the world to break the silence and protect hundreds and millions of women, uh, children, both men, uh, boy child as well as girl children across the world from this pandemic of exploitation. Uh, we sincerely hope that you will be blessed with good health, mental courage and abundance of love in your heart. We can see abundance of compassion is there in you. You have shared so much. Your voice has become little matured. Yeah. <laughs> you, you were sort of, when I listened to you in 2011, 2014, you were like a fighter. And it looks as if you have, you know, bit become little sort of the tone. <laughs> <laughs> so we show all but, the uh, Charika, thank you so much. I'm honored and humble. humble. <laughs> that you thought of me for this series. Um, I, I, I have my, my deepest pranams for Appa and Amma, who are my spiritual parents. I, I want to thank them for what they are to me, to the world. And uh, it is, it's, it's so, so humbling to be part of this intergenerational dialogue. Sanara and Tiara, you are our flame, you are our hope, you are our light. And um, I hope uh, through you, we, we, we ignite uh, a world of um, positivity in, the, in, in every young mind and hope this, this series that you've started has a very, very uh, replicating effort. Sharika, thank you so much for being my sister, my friend, and uh, my confidant. Uh, it's truly humbling to be part of this journey. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Sanara and Tiara for engaging so lively as always and contributing to this uh, dialogue, uh, especially uh, you know, uh, while studying for advanced level exam and ordinary level exam. So they have really sort of, uh, they're carrying a huge responsibility uh, over a period of 12 months. So we are very grateful to you, Sanara and Tiara. And also I would like to thank uh, um, 
uh, today, uh, Madhushan, who has really played a big role in this series, uh, uh, spent hours and hours editing and, you know, uh, doing all the audiovisual stuff that we are not so, you know, uh, uh, acquainted with. And also, I would like to thank uh, Sanji for all the support she has extended to us and also Kala for connecting Dr. Ari and Mrs. Ari uh, uh, with us uh, in this uh, dialogue series. Thank you so much. May all of you be well, happy, and peaceful. Thank you.